Today I'm going to talk to you about 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. The word debates. Recently, I've been following a couple of gentlemen on YouTube and on Facebook. They're both members of the same church. One is the pastor, the other is the congregant. They are debating in a public forum whether or not the church is universal, local, or both. Now, the conversation has denigrated to the point where both parties have accused each other of being heretics, liars, blasphemers of Christ, teaching a false gospel, and ill-motivated in their spirit and heart. And I ask you, is this debate worth that? No, it's not. Let me tell you why. If you discover that the church is only local, what does that do? Does that change anything? No. The scripture says you're not to neglect the gathering of yourselves together. You are going to gather together. If you discover that the Bible teaches that the church is only universal, what's that going to do? Nothing. Because you're still going to gather together locally. And if you discover that the Bible teaches that the church is both universal and local, how is that going to affect you? Not at all. You're still going to gather together locally. This is the kind of debate that Paul speaks against. He speaks against it because it goes nowhere. It doesn't affect you as a Christian in your walk one bit what you believe of this matter, provided you take seriously the commandment to gather together. There is absolutely no impact on your Christian walk, your Christian faith, your Christian belief, if one day you discover the church is only local, or only universal, or both. So why are these two men going at it over this issue? Paul says this is the kind of communication and debate that he doesn't want to find in the Corinthian church when he comes back to see them. He writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20, For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. And Paul further comments about this very subject to Timothy, and he says, This kind of debate that these two fellows are having is about pride. It's not about truth, and it's not about benefiting the body of Christ. It's about being right. He writes in 1 Timothy 6, verse 4, He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words. Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. So again, this kind of unproductive gnat straining only ends up, as Paul writes to Timothy, in railing, in envy, in strife. The church is to avoid this. And in the case of these two independent fundamental Baptists, both members of the same church, the pastor and his congregant, their communication had degraded to the point where they called each other heretics, liars, disingenuous, preachers of a false gospel, and the list goes on. This is what Paul warns against, because there is no positive outcome to debating issues that don't have a significant impact. There are bigger fish to fry. And Jesus addressed this problem with the Pharisees the scribes and the Pharisees, when he talked to them about tithing. He commended them for tithing 10% of their little herb gardens on their back porches. He said, it's great that you do that, but you do that at the expense of weightier matters. So listening to these two independent fundamental Baptists who call each other brother, go at it, and finally declare each other heretics, is nothing short of railing. And Paul speaks against that also. Of course, the problem that arises when you declare somebody a heretic, the scripture's clear. Put the heretic out from among you. So who do you put out? Do you put the pastor out? Or do you put the congregant out? Or does somebody back down and admit that they're a heretic and repent? There has to be a resolve to the matter. 
This is what Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians. He doesn't want to come back to the church and find people engaged in this kind of debate and communication, which only ends in strife. And that's exactly where these two guys are at. Listening to them go at it, it's shameful. They're both shaming the name of Christ and failing to demonstrate the love that the brethren are to have one for another. Now let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Paul writes, But now I have written unto you, not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. Now let's have a look at that carefully. He makes the statement, If any man that is called a brother. That is to say, people who identify themselves as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what he's talking about. Whether you think they are or not is immaterial. It's sufficient for Paul if people identify themselves as brothers and sisters in Christ, then this applies to them. And he puts the railer in the same category as the fornicator, the coveter, the idolater, the drunkard, and the extortioner. Now what is a railer? A railer is one given to opprobrious communication. That means communication of an accusatory nature, name-calling, of a condescending, cynical, superior, presumptive, arrogant, insulting nature, of a judgmental nature that is judging the heart and motive of a person, and this sort of thing. That is railing. And among the brethren, Paul says it's unacceptable. Now this is the result of the kinds of debates that Paul speaks against. These two gentlemen, and I use that term loosely in this fundamental Baptist church, are so intent on being right about whether the church is universal, local, or both, that their conversation has denigrated to railing, yet they can't see it. And Paul says, no, you're to put the railer out, because they're like a fornicator, yet these men can't see that they're railing at each other, yet they call each other brother. This is a big problem in churches today. And the reason I think it's a problem is because these people have nothing better to do with their time. When you live in an affluent society and you're a Christian and there is nothing pressing on you to challenge your faith, nothing really. In America, there's no persecution per se, no Spanish inquisitions, no burnings at the stake, no massacres of the innocent, nothing of that sort. You have nothing but time to speculate and strain gnats. And so Matthew 23, 24 writes, Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. This is what Jesus is talking about. These men arguing over things that don't have an impact on your Christian walk. They don't matter. You can believe one or the other. It's not significant. It's like the debate over Nephilim. Did angels come down and mate with human beings or did they not? I have heard so-called brothers in Christ go at each other on this issue, again to the point of calling each other liars, heretics, and so on and so forth, and end up dividing over whether or not angels mated with women. It's madness. And I say to myself, for what purpose? What will it matter if you're right about this doctrine? Will it impact anything you do? No, it won't. It's simply theory. It's all stuff you can push around in your brain. It's nothing more than entertainment. So similarly, these gentlemen arguing, is the church universal or local or both? It leads nowhere. Somebody has to back down or somebody has to be put out of the church. So if the pastor's wrong, who's going to put him out? If the pastor turns out to be the heretic according to the congregant, who's going to put the pastor out? Now, if the inverse is true, and the pastor decides, you, the congregant, are the heretic, then he's going to have to put you out. Now, if he doesn't put you out, he's not obeying the scripture. This is the kind of thing Paul was warning against. 
These types of debates don't go anywhere good. They end up in strife, envy, backbiting, and opprobrious communication, railing. So these two men were railing on each other. Finally, they took the conversation out of the public arena, which is a good thing. Unfortunately, not before they had inflicted personal, emotional, and spiritual damage on each other and upon the body of Christ in general. Those of you who listen to me, you know these things. Don't let somebody bait you in to that kind of a communication. And if somebody online wants to call you names, judge your motives and your character, and call you a heretic, don't return evil for evil. Let their opprobrious railing be upon them. Don't become partakers of their sin. Don't take it on yourself. Thank you for listening.